Hi, and welcome to the Commonwealth Policy Center's Candidate Forum with 7th uh, District Supreme Court uh, Justice Samuel Wright. Uh, we're, we've got an opportunity to learn more about his candidacy, uh, why he's running, and why he's asking for voters to reelect him. Justice Wright, welcome to the uh, program. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me on. I do, again, appreciate your time. There are a lot of things that uh, you could be doing right now. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is an opportunity to let voters know uh, more about your candidacy, uh, your background, and uh, why you are running again. So if you could tell, tell the voters a little bit about yourself. Okay. I uh, was born and raised in Letcher County, Kentucky, a small community called Thornton. Um, my father was a probation and parole officer for 42 years. Uh, my mother ran a small country store. And we lived in the back of the store, in a small apartment in the back of the store is where I grew up. I uh, grew up working in the store. And uh, then uh, when I then went to Hazard Community College after graduating from high school, and uh, got my associate's degree, and then went on down to the University of Kentucky where I got my bachelor's degree, and then stayed on and went to the University of Kentucky's College of Law and got my judicial doctorate. Um, during summers while in college, I worked at a coal tipple, uh, helped pave a way through school, and um, that gave me a lot of insight into the industries that are in my region and the, the type of work and its impact, both from the company's point of view and from the workers. It's, it's, I think it's been very valuable. Um, so, and then after I graduated, I joined a law firm of Cook and Ride. I came, returned to the mountains where I always wanted to live and work. Um, worked there and then I broke off and formed my own law firm in 98, excuse me, 89. Then in 90, 1992, I was elected district judge. 1993, I was elected circuit judge for four consecutive terms. And then in 2015, I ran for and was elected to the Supreme Court of Kentucky. Very good, very good. So you do have uh, several years of experience on the bench before you came to the state Supreme Court. And uh, uh, I'd like to ask you, you mentioned, so you are in Eastern Kentucky, the seventh district comprises 22 counties, probably the hardest hit counties in the last uh, five to 10 years with the coal economy being hurt uh, with the shutdown of our economy in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, are you seeing, uh, because of the economic downturn in that part of the state, uh, are you seeing more cases come before the bench? I'm, I'm speaking in general. Is there more crime? Is there more uh, issues with drugs? Because is there a relationship between the downturn and the economy, I guess is what I'm asking, and uh, uh, cases before judges there? Uh, I don't believe there is. There is uh, the coal industry is one that has a lot of danger and therefore it generated uh, quite a bit of litigation for the population and size of the area. Um, of course, you know, since 2015, I've been on the Supreme Court. So the uh, during the transitions of much of what you're talking about, I've, I had already gone to the Supreme Court, so I haven't seen those, but I keep in touch with the judges throughout the region. And uh, I don't think it is creating a, a real in, increase. There are some things that have created some massive ca uh, cases. Uh, there's uh, some been some litigation over the dust mask that the miners would use. And those cases are very complex and take a lot and so there have been a number of those over the years that uh, have, uh, don't know that they've created large numbers, but they're very complex in and of themselves. Yeah, very good. Uh, since judicial candidates cannot generally talk about policy questions, could you tell us, and, and that, by the way, for the viewers, uh, 
is so that if a case comes before the bench uh, that they've spoken on while on the campaign trail, they might have to recuse themselves uh, if that case does come before them. So, so Justice Wright, and you are the sitting su state Supreme Court Justice for the seventh district. Can you tell us how voters can make an informed decision on judicial candidates? What are some things that they should look for in a good judicial candidate? Hmm. Well, I think experience is very important. Um, one of the candidates doesn't have any, has ever served as a judge. Uh, so, but, so I do think it's important that a person be able to know and understand what a trial judge is dealing with. It's very different than being an attorney. I know when I became a judge, there was a transition I had to go through from being an advocate to being trying the case and trying to see and comprehend, make sure all sides were being just, treat, just treatment. So there is a vast difference there. there. There's a real transition, it's very important. And unless you have presided over a trial, you, there's a lot of things you might not realize or understand about what the judge is coping with. And I think that's very important in reviewing this because we have to evaluate, make rulings on how the judge did, whether he did it in a way to make it fair to everyone. Justice Wright, was that a difficult transition for you from going from the role of an advocate before a judge to being the actual judge where you've got to hear both sides and uh, be even keeled and then to administer justice? What was that transition process like for you? Well, no, I, I really feel that uh, it really suited my temperament. It was something I enjoyed and uh, uh, when I took over, the Lecture Circuit Court, um, the prior year, the person training on the docket management, how to manage your cases, was doing a presentation and uh, had one of the computer fan fold. If you remember the old big wide sheets with the alternating green and white lines and mm -hmm. case per line. And he had a print out there and he got the top sheet and started unfolding it across the presentation hall. And he wasn't able to get it unfolded folded or even close to it and said, I don't know who has Letcher County, but you have the worst mess in the state. Hmm. So that's what I stepped into uh, when I took over. The average age of the cases at the time was five and a half years. Oh boy. And uh, so I, I took a lot of work and dedication to trying to straighten it up. And I, I did, it became one of the most efficient courts in the state. Uh, so. But as far as the transition in temperament, I think it does very much suit my temperament to be a judge. I, I have loved my years on the bench. I think they have been very rewarding. Uh, the biggest problem I had was for several years, it was very difficult not to step down when an attorney I saw doing something I didn't think they were approaching the right way and not say, do it this way. <laughs> instead. Uh, so sometimes it got frustrating when they were not uh, getting or making their point well or getting the evidence improperly and uh, you can't step out and do it for them but sometimes it gets frustrating. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about that uh, temperament obviously is very very important to a good judge a fair-minded judge can you give us some insight as to how you maintain temperament? If you're seeing something, a, a, an attorney not presenting the evidence in the correct way, or you're seeing something frustrating, give us some insight as to how you hmm. keep an even keel, keep that proper temperament. Well, the greatest concern I always had was I wanted to see a just result coming out of my court. So if, if an attorney messed up, then their clients suffered when it wasn't the client's fault. Uh, so I would often, I would bring them outside the presence of the jury. I would go to chambers for a hearing and uh, in ruling on it, I would explain at great length so that I could, they would, I should pick up and understand what they needed to be doing. But by, when you make your ruling by explaining at length, you bring a lot more and you can, you know, illuminate for them if what they need to do, how they should be conducting themselves, what needs to happen there in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. 
want to move on to some of the rules that judicial candidates have. We just mentioned one, generally they should not speak specifically to policy questions, whether you're, you know, where you are on the life issue or other specific issues, you're supposed to, I understand you're supposed to refrain from that. You're also not supposed to talk about political affiliation. Is that correct? You're registered- It's a nonpartisan race and that's correct, generally. You know, there has been cases coming down in the recent years where it said that you can do that, but it's a nonpartisan race. And I, it's better not to label people, I believe, to look at their record instead of labels. And so, but that's, that's true there. But now you can, if asked, you can specifically say what your party is, but in the past you could not. And, but even now it's frowned upon or it's discouraged, I guess, by the rules, but you can do it. I see. Because we have seen in some judicial races, we've seen judicial candidates uh, specifically identify with the party. They'll say, I am registered as this uh, or as that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and I've seen pushback against that where other candidates say you shouldn't do that. Uh, and I want to go to the voters. You know, voters are trying to figure out who to vote for based on what the voters believe is important and um, good policy. And since voters are going to be somewhat limited in what they can learn about uh, a judge, well, let me rephrase it. Let me ask it this way. Is that fair to the voters that they will have minimal information about candidates for a judicial race? Is it... Uh, uh, and I know that's a tough question, but I'm just putting myself in the shoes of a voter. I want to learn as much as I can about a candidate, whether they're a, a political candidate for like the state house or state senate or a judicial candidate. I do want to know if they hold my values, if they are conservative or if they are liberal. And uh, is that fair to the voters to ask them to weigh in on a race like, a, like yours, the seventh uh, district state Supreme Court with having minimal information? Well, I don't think there is minimal information. What there is, is we're, the legislature is passing laws. They're setting policy. Mm -hmm. As the court is making sure that we follow and enforce the laws. Yeah. And by doing that, we're not setting policy on it. And if you have a question about how someone does that, generally you can look at their record, where they've stood, how they've conducted themselves. So in terms of what you're looking at as a judge, I, I don't feel it is minimal information. It is, you can, there's a lot that can be picked up from past cases. And although we can't say how we would rule on a particular issue in the future because we would then be prejudging something without benefit of the argument of both sides and the intense scrutiny that we do of the issue. But if you are looking at a past record we had, I mean, uh, for instance, uh, since I've been on the Supreme Court, we've had where the state sought to close an abortion clinic in Lexington. That came before us. And uh, the, there was an injunction being sought to prevent that from happening. And we ruled that the state could do that. Uh, so I can't go and say how I will do on any other issue, but I can point to my record. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Kentucky Right to Life has recommended me uh, based on an interview and those type of things. Also, you've got, uh, well, in, in most areas, there are some things that you can look at in that regard how they handle it, what they do. Um, Justice Scalia, who was on the US Supreme Court, uh, his book, he talked about how he was a textualist. So he followed the clear text of it according to the way it was written at the time it was written. And I think that is the way it's the reasonable approach of what should be done. And that's what I've tried to do as a judge. Now, you know, there might be an, a, a conflict sometimes, not all laws, unfortunately. Well, as Scalia said, you know, in evaluating a judge, you can't do that just based on whether you like the decision or not. You need to look at what they were dealing with, unless you thought all laws were written perfectly. So, 
And uh, I think we can all agree, not quite all of them are perfect, but uh, you, you have to interpret that and take it from that point of view. Very good. I'd like to go back to that uh, case before you involving the Lexington Abortion Center. Uh, yes. My recollection of that was that they were operating in violation of state law. They were not meeting. One of the requirements, I believe, was that they did not have an ambulatory service agreement with a local hospital, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. I think they did not meet health standards as well. Could you tell us more about that case and then also how you ruled, how you came down on it? The, a lot of the issue was the sanitation of the unit, how it was being conducted. And uh, that, that was the issue that the state came in on. Okay. And they sought an injunction from the trial court and it was appealed uh, if I'm remembering correctly, because now it has been a few years ago, we, instead of letting it set and take more time at the Court of Appeals, we took it on up to the Supreme Court. Occasionally, we'll do that instead of letting them do it. Most cases will go through the various steps, but that one, we took it, and we said that they could not do an injunction that would prevent the state from closing it, so we ruled that the state could, in fact, close it. Okay, was that a unanimous decision uh, by this? Yes, it was. Okay, very good, very good. Are there any other cases that stand out in your tenure on the state Supreme Court that would tell voters a little bit about your jurisprudence on other issues? Obviously the life issue that we're talking about that does tell voters something. Your uh, recommendation by Kentucky Right to Life says something, but are there other cases that uh, you can speak mm -hmm. on that tell give some voters some insight into your judicial philosophy and your jurisprudence? Well, um, let's see. One aspect of it is that all the justices are elected from different regions. We have seven of us and each one is elected from a different district or region. And uh, in my opinion, keeping that in place and not and kind of defining by the areas and the understanding is very important uh, to illustrate that because that sounds very vague uh, is we had a case in which the police had arrested a man and he was able to steal the police car and escape. Uh, they were in pursuit. He drove out on the strip mine road and uh, he abandoned it there and took to the woods. And uh, the opinion as written at first by the majority said that that wasn't theft of this police car. And cause it was left in a road here for them to find. And that so they didn't intend to permanently deprive the police of it. Uh, I wrote a dissent in that case because I'm familiar with strip mine roads. M many, much of your audience may not be, but I'm very familiar with them. I've had murder victims hidden and left on strip mine roads. I've had them take equipment and strip it and huge, huge mining equipment and leave it there and do it. It is, they are rugged. They are not, uh, the term road is misleading because they can get extremely difficult to use, uh, very rugged. And so uh, it wasn't just left. It wasn't somebody going for a joy ride. He obviously intended to take it. You can determine intent from his taking of the vehicle and him leaving it on the strip mine road did not in any way offset that to show that he didn't intend to permanently deprive. So that was my dissent. Now, uh, it still went it went the other way against me. The, the majority was four, three. We often have a split in the court uh, or can on occasion. So that's as close as you can get one and, you know, it not go the other way. Two, when I wrote my dissent, two other justices agreed with me and joined. But it, by my understanding and insight and knowledge of strip mine roads we, here in the mountains of Eastern Kentucky, I had an insight into this that was different than the other justices and therefore I wrote the dissent. And I think that type of thing is very important. So uh, I don't know if that answered all of your, but the, we have a number of cases like that. I have 
developed. Uh, we had one uh, White versus Commonwealth, and can't give you the citation off the top of my head, but if you want it, I'll get it for you, in which there was an issue uh, about the death penalty. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that uh, someone who ha is um, trying to think of the current correct term, but uh, if they've got a, if they, if they have a mental deficiency that they're not uh, below a certain level, then they cannot receive the death penalty. Um, then the case, this guy was very close to the, that line and the majority was writing an opinion that said that the, because they didn't take into account the margin of error of the testing, that therefore the death penalty couldn't be imposed in the case. What I wrote was, and that our death and that the death penalty law in that regard was incorrect and couldn't be utilized. What I wrote was that the each element has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So whether the the margin of error of the testing is something the judge could and should take into effect, uh, consideration, therefore it did not uh, negate or throw out and cause our that portion of our uh, death penalty statute to be invalid. Uh, so, what is the status of Kentucky's death penalty uh, right now? I understand. Is it? Are we still under a moratorium on death on executions in Kentucky? No, no, we haven't been for a long, long time. Uh, but uh, my understanding is, and this is outside the control of the courts, or what we deal with, is that there is a problem about getting the um, the chemicals or drugs to administer it with. And so there's not been one done since 2000 and I'm not, I would, maybe eight, somewhere in that neighborhood. I can't remember exactly, uh, but uh, that was the last time one actually was executed because of the difficulties of getting the proper equipment, drugs, et cetera. Would you say, is that one of the toughest issues that a judge would deal with a death penalty case when you're talking about the state taking the life of, a, even if it's a convicted uh, criminal? Is that one of the certainly. toughest issues? Certainly. Um, when I was a new judge to the circuit bench, uh, there was one of the circuit judges who had had a death penalty case. And he did impose the death penalty because he felt it was his duty. But after he did that, he he stepped down. He left the bench because mm -hmm. he couldn't. He, he didn't want to have to deal with that ever again. It's obviously it is it is a very difficult decision to make. Yeah, very good. In the previous uh, comment, you we talked about law enforcement and a case that came before uh, before the state supreme court. Uh, regarding a stolen police vehicle. Of course, law enforcement is in the national conversation right now. Uh, the city of Minneapolis City Council recently voted to defund their police department, whatever that means. Uh, what are your thoughts, if you're, if you're able to share your thoughts on the police? And let me ask it to you this way. How important are the police to any community? Okay. The... The circumstances that are evolving in the protest and what they might do, I think I'm somewhat limited in that regard because they're, you know, they're a protest, they're liable to be cases that come before us. But in terms of how important they are, yeah. they're vital. Yeah. They're totally vital. Um, as I said, I had, I've got two of my ancestors who were Deputy U.S. Marshals who are who died in the line of duty and are on the memorial wall in Washington, D.C. Just a couple, two or three years ago, I had the privilege of going up there. It's very moving to see that. My father, as I told you earlier, was a probation and pro officer for 42 years. Uh, when they formed the Fraternal Order of Police chapter in Letcher County, uh, I was a charter member. I signed the original charter. Um, and uh, when I ran for the Supreme Court in 2015. I was endorsed by the Commonwealth Attorneys Association. 
only two candidates in history have ever been endorsed by them. And I was endorsed by the Letcher County Fraternal Order of Police. I was endorsed by the Pike County Fraternal Order of Police. I was endorsed by the Boyd County or Fraternal Order of Police. Um, it's, it's something I've dealt with. I've seen the officers. I've seen what they do. I've seen the cases come through my court for many years. So it's, uh, they are vital. And, you know, we need to have our best there. They need to be, they need to be compensated in accordance with the type of job they are required to do because it's very demanding. We want the best and we need to take care of the best. Very good. Uh, Justice Wright, we've got just a few minutes until uh, we need to close. Uh, I'd like to, us to look at the U.S. Supreme Court. There is a range of judicial philosophy represented on that court. I'm wondering if you could answer who you would most align with as far as jurisprudence, judicial philosophy. On one hand, you have somebody, you mentioned Anthony Scalia. So let's go with him. Of course, he passed away a few years ago, but you've got a Anthony Scalia on the court. And then you have on the other side of the spectrum, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, do you identify with either one of those or, or maybe other, another Supreme Court uh, member? Well, the, I, I raised uh, Scalia and spoke of him because uh, I've read his book. I've listened to him speak uh, in, at events and uh, as well as reading opinions and, that he's written. And, I, you know, I probably wouldn't always vote exactly the same way he does because everybody has different thoughts. But for the most part, I agree with his approach, and that is that taking the common sense, reasonable meaning of the law as it's written, when it, from the time period it was written, is the appropriate way to approach it. And that's what we should do and how we interpret it. You go by the clear, common sense, reasonable text of the law. And we enforce that. Of course, you know, we have to we, I, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth, and that's a sacred oath. It's a very important thing to me, and the, so, you know, I follow it. That means I follow all the rights in the Constitution, whether it be the freedoms of speech or uh, Second Amendment's right to bear arms, which has been an issue, but that's an oath I took. It means a lot to me, and it's a sacred oath, and I follow it. Very good. You use the word contextualist approach to the Constitution. I've heard other terms. I think they're synonymous, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, an originalist approach or a strict constructionist approach. That's one view of the Constitution. Is that correct? Are those synonymous terms? Context I'm not sure, you know, different people, different words have a different degree of meaning, but uh, I was, the text is what I'm looking at and I follow the text of it. And if there's an ambiguity about it, I follow the text as written when it was written. Um, the, uh, my last opponent in 2015 was Janet Stumpo. And one of the things that I brought out was one of her opinions where she had written about a case that involved a man who had uh, found a couple out on a date and it was the birthday of one of them. And he murdered the man, he raped the woman, he owned the body of her boyfriend. Uh, he hauled her to the lake that she thought she was going to. Finally, she dashed away, she got away. And in interpreting that case, my opponent then, she wrote that uh, the death penalty wasn't appropriate considering the changing moral attitudes hmm of the time. Well, the law is the law. Uh, if you start interpreting it according to what you conceive of as the spirit of the law, then you can twist it to make it sound and mean anything you wish to make it mean. And that's not appropriate. That's not what we're there to do. We are to enforce and make sure the law is understood and done appropriately. 
Very good. The term that I remember when I was back in school was uh, the, the Constitution is a living, breathing document that is interpret interpreted from generation to generation based on the changing mores and values of a culture. Uh, and what I'm hearing you say is that, did you make that an issue when Janet Stumbo ruled according to that, the living, breathing document? That, that wasn't the phrasing. I did the description that we did. And we, what I did was I quoted her. I didn't put words in her mouth that she didn't utter. I wanted to be very clear on it. So she, but she said the uh, uh, changing societal morals or nor I've, I've forgotten the exact word there, but that's what I, when we were having it, I was able to point to, as I said, you can evaluate judges on the record. Yeah. I pointed to her record, which that was part of it. And so that's, I, I disagreed with that. And that was part of my campaign. Very good. Justice Sam Wright, uh, we've got just a moment here until we're going to close. Can you tell the voters why you're the best candidate for the seventh district state Supreme Court? My experience uh, I, and my, oh, my attitude, my even handedness, I'm there to see justice done and follow the law. Uh, when I was a circuit judge, I started a parent education clinic to reduce the harm children suffer in a divorce. It was the third one in the state, the first East I-75. Uh, it's very important that we see and try to do those things. 2004, I got a grant and operated a drug court until I was elected to the Supreme Court in 2015. Uh, the success rate we had, our graduation rate was amongst the best in the state. The, we did a study just before I went to the Supreme Court when I was applying for a grant to expand it. And what we found was that uh, of the graduates of, from my direct court, 0% were convicted of a felony within the two-year time period of the study. 9% had got, been convicted of a misdemeanor. If we sent them to prison or to probation, 59% would have been convicted again within the same time period. So uh, it was such that the lecture fiscal court passed a resolution that describes my drug court as amazingly successful. So I'm looking always to ways to we can improve our court system because we are the administrative head of the court, the judges of the Supreme Court is. That's a duty that most people aren't as aware of, but also that we follow the law appropriately and clearly. All right. Very good. Justice Sam Wright, thank you again for your time. Uh, best wishes to you on the campaign trail and for all of those tuning in. Remember that the primary election is June 23rd. In this particular race, there are three candidates and the top two vote getters will go on to the general election on November the 3rd. Justice Wright, again, God bless. Best wishes to you. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate the opportunity.